intro uh, first or questions? Oh, sorry, intro first. Start with your intro. Intro yeah. first, okay. Mm -hmm. And now I know what the first question yeah. is going to be. <laughs> 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 start, that's good. Uh, good morning. Yeah. How is everybody? Thanks for coming. Just when you thought we were done with elections, here's another one. So I do appreciate everybody coming out here today. Like many of you, I'm a product of the San Fernando Valley, born in Tarzana, grew up in Woodland Hills and Encino. My grandfather had a small business. We called it the Schmata business. It was in the Schmata business. So I remember as a kid learning about the industry, the trials and tribulations of dealing with city government, state government, county government, at all levels. So that was kind of a good foundation to know where the business community is coming from. Now, in my capacity working for LA City Council Member Paul Koretz, I'm assigned to the Encino Chamber and working with business organizations to help cut through some of the red tape. In fact, one memory just came to mind. I see Ricky Gelb's name up on the ceiling there. Ricky, you know, who's been in the Valley for years, just tried to get a new restaurant into one of his buildings near White Oak and Ventura, and the red tape that they had to go through cost tens of thousands of dollars. So we were able to work with him and expedite it, get it through quicker. And I think that's a symbol of what's wrong at all levels of government, especially the state. What happened to common sense? So I want to go up to Sacramento make sure the valley gets its fair share of resources, stop the waste, and prioritize. And work with each and every one of you on what our priorities are before I introduce a piece of legislation in Sacramento to make sure our priorities are right, there's no negative unintended consequences. But just in general, I look forward to working with each and every one of you. And thank you for being here today. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Andra Hoffman. I'm an educator. I work for Glendale Community College. I currently teach California state and local government politics. I am also the director of government relations for the college. And prior to that, I ran the job placement center for nine years and our internship program. And as a matter of fact, Glendale was a VICA member for quite some time, and I did attend lots of meetings here. Uh, because I worked closely with our Director of Economic and Workforce Development. Um, and the college has been through several changes. We have a new president, and we hope to again join as a member. Uh, I was born and raised here in the San Fernando Valley. I'm a product of what was one of the best uh, educational systems in America, and I hope to bring that back if I'm elected in the state legislature. I attended LA Unified Public Schools. I graduated from Grant High School. I have my master's degree from Cal State Northridge. I hope to focus on uh, fully funding education, all education, pre-K all the way up through uh, our great university system and community colleges. I also want to focus on bringing jobs back to the West San Fernando Valley. We need to create uh, more opportunities for our young people so they're not leaving the valley, so they decide to stay. I never left. I have two college-age kids. They call me a loser mm -hmm. for never leaving the valley, but I am a true valley. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, never mind the fact that they both came back to the valley and they're here. Um, we need to bring vocational programs back to middle schools and high schools. We need to focus on job creation. I'm excited about helping to implement the Affordable Care Act, and we also need to do something about the transportation problem here, especially in the West Valley, and the traffic problem. So I'm excited to be here today, and thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Damian Carroll. I want to thank FICA for putting together uh, this forum today on what is a seat that will be of great importance to the West San Fernando Valley for potentially the next decade, and for so many of you for coming out to find out about the candidates and hopefully go out to the business community and the folks in your area and let them know that we're having an election and let them know what you found out today. What qualifies me for this job? Well, I think there's three main things that set me apart from the pack. Number one is experience. I'm the only candidate in this race to have served in state government. Uh, I worked for six years uh, for a terrific state assembly member, terrific state senator, Jack Scott and Mike Fewer, working very closely with organizations like FICA throughout that time to solve issues specifically of importance to business in the state. Uh, they're different than local issues, and it's a different setup in Sacramento, and it's one that I know very well we'll be able to hit the ground running when I go up to the Capitol. 
Number two is my personal investment in the district. Uh, I am a family man. Uh, my wife is a public school teacher in the district, and I have two children of public school age, uh, the older of which is in second grade uh, and going into a public school. We are playing for the same stakes as so many constituents in the valley. Uh, we go to Temple, uh, we work and live, drive in the valley, uh, and our children are gonna be growing up in this area, and we very much hope that they're gonna be able to stay here, uh, continuing through LAUSD, and indeed going to public universities here, and, and being able to get good jobs uh, when they leave the household. That's important to so many in the Valley, and it's something that we feel very personally. And number three is vision. Uh, in my time in government, my time working with the community, I've developed a very specific vision for the West San Fernando Valley that I hope to begin implementing on day one up in Sacramento. It's a vision of a valley that asks for bold projects, uh, that thinks bigger, and that makes sure that we are getting our fair share in this area in the ways that for such a long time uh, we have come up short. So I'm eager to represent you up in Sacramento, and I'm here today to earn your votes. Thank you. I'm Matthew Dubovne, and um, I want to thank Mike today for hosting this debate. I want to be here uh, to listen and hopefully help inform us on some of the issues uh, that concern not only business, but the Valley in general. Uh, for the last eight years, almost nine now, I've served in Congressman Brad Sherman's office, uh, working on a daily basis to resolve problems for constituents and businesses, making sure that the Valley was getting its fair share from the federal government, and working with our partners at state and local government. And in that time, I've been able to realize that the communities of the Valley are unique and special, and had a real opportunity to work with not just chambers of commerce, but community groups, neighborhood councils, nonprofits, to really understand the needs of the Valley. That's the type of approach I want to take to Sacramento. What I've learned in my time from Congressman Sherman is that, you know, people need jobs. People want an opportunity to send their kids to college, have better schools, and the number one goal for everyone up here today and for every legislature is to create an environment to foster that. You know, for too long, California has kind of taken the approach that we just have amazing weather and great beaches and who would want to go anywhere else? But unfortunately, we're starting to lose businesses to other states. It's becoming an increasing competitive atmosphere, not just to other states, but globally. The film industry is starting to go other places. Businesses are getting up and going to other states. We need to make sure we do everything <coughs> in the assembly and as a state to make sure we're as competitive as possible. So my number one goal of going to Sacramento is to make sure that not only the Valley, but our state is able to compete nationally and internationally to make sure this is the number one destination for new businesses, to create the jobs that will give us a new tax base to fund higher education. I'm a product of a community college, a Cal State, and a UC, so I know how important it is to fund higher education, to fund new products for open space and protect our environment, and to fund the new health care bill. But before we can do any of that, we have to make sure we have a climate that fosters business and grows jobs. And I want to earn not only Vika's support, but all of yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to also uh, send, extend my appreciation to Stuart Waldman and Vika for sponsoring this. Also, the sponsors have provided a great last year. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And, and this is a very important seat, as we've heard. Um, it's an important election. Uh, the state assembly controls a budget that's close to $100 billion. And, and it's very important that we have people that are up there in Sacramento representing the interests of the Valley, but also that are stewards of our taxpayers' money. And I, I think it's very important that we have people or legislators who are, are not necessarily professional politicians, but are uh, honest and ethical uh, uh, folks who have business experience uh, like I have. I'm a certified financial planner, I'm a stockbroker, I'm an investment advisor, I, I do taxes, I'm a real estate broker. I've, I've, I've had a degree in finance and real estate, and, and my experience for the last 30 years has been has been dealing with, with, with all the financial issues that are out there. And uh, we've gone through a very tough economy, as you all know, our, our unemployment rate still in LA County is close to 10%, and, and we really need to focus on jobs as our primary focus, and that will be one of my top priorities. There's a lot of people talking about jobs, but if you look at the legislation that's been coming out of Sacramento the last few years, much of it has been what I would consider to be job killer type of legislation. And my focus would be on, on trying to create an environment to attract employers and companies to come to California and to stay in California. We don't want the governor of Texas coming and poaching our, our employees and our, our companies. So fiscal responsibility, fiscal restraint, living with your means, creating a, 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 a rainy day fund or reserve account that's legitimate, 
looking seriously at the major issues that, we're, that are challenging, that are, that are facing uh, us here in California is going to be a top priority. I really do think that we've kicked the can down the street way too long and it's too heavy to kick any, any further. And I'm referring to specifically pension reform and, and, and the unfunded liabilities for health care and for, for pensions. And so there needs to be some strong leadership. Um, I, I'm an independent person. I have knowledge and experience. My parents are born and raised in the Valley as well as I am and my wife. And uh, I love the Valley. I love living here. Um, I, I'm, I'm a product of, of all of this good things for here. And I, and I just appreciate you guys coming out here and, and listening to us. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Well, all right, Jeff, now you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's um, a number of things that I'd like to introduce. Definitely want to focus on senior care, education, stimulating the economy, things that were said here. But you know what would be a novel idea? Is to go revisit bad laws and things that are cumbersome and causing business not to flourish. I remember Jane at uh, Valpac, you asked. Um, we talk about incentives for new business to lure them here, but what are we doing for existing businesses that are here now? Yes. So I would actually look to revise some outdated obstructionist code when I got there. Um, so I would like to expand the film tax credit and bring production back to California and back to the West San Fernando Valley. Um, I have lots of support in the legislature in terms of my endorsement, and I hope to work with Raul Bocanegra because I know this is something that's important to him, and, that, and it's important to me too. I have, um, I know somebody who has a production company, and they do all of their filming, every everything in, in the state of Oregon. And they've worked with the legislature in the state of Oregon to be able to have credits in Oregon and when they go to film in Oregon, every single business in that community grows. So it's not just the film business that's growing. And they're bringing people from California to Oregon. You know, I have many friends who live in the West San Fernando Valley, and they either have to leave California or leave their families for long periods of time, or they're out of work. And so I'm really hoping to be able to expand the tax credits for, for the film industry and bring some of that production back here. I want to think bolder in the valley. Uh, I want us to think bigger. And one of the ways that we should do that is by focusing on our transportation projects. Uh, we have an Orange Line busway in the valley that was already uh, over its projected ridership in the first month after it had uh, been built. Uh, and that Orange Line is now at capacity so that we can't add any additional buses to that system. Uh, I want to move forward. I want to make that Orange Line busway into a light rail. And so the first thing that needs to be done is to repeal a portion of what's known as the Robbins Bill, uh, which is a piece of state legislation that prohibited uh, that busway from being built into a light rail. Uh, we need to think bigger in the valley in terms of how we approach what we are asking for. We shouldn't settle for second best anymore. And if I'm up in Sacramento, I'll be working together with legislators like Assemblymember Nazarian and Paul Krikorian here locally, who both endorsed my campaign to fight for priorities and unify around making sure that the Valley gets its fair share. Uh, so that first bill that I will be introducing is to repeal the Robbins Bill and put us on track to a modern and uh, worthy transportation system of the San Fernando Valley. And I would concur with my opponent's last two statements that these are both worthy bills. I would also like to take a look at reinstating some enterprise zones. <coughs> I think that the governor uh, what he did with the new tax credits for manufacturing, the relief sales tax on that, creating some hiring incentives was a good thing. I think the state needed that to increase manufacturing. But I do feel like in the Valley, we benefited from having these enterprise zones. I'd love to see uh, how we can relook at bringing them back with maybe taking some of the abuse that was happening with them uh, to the Valley to increase business activity in specific areas uh, and then increase jobs. And so I know Jane's business has benefited from that. Chatsworth, I know Canova Park has had a lot of growth in areas those enterprise zones. I'd love to revisit having a modified enterprise zone in specific areas that won't take businesses from other parts of the state, but help grow businesses in specific regions where we need job growth. So I'd look to do that. Well, my focus, as I said before, would be a, a lot to do with financial stuff. I, I think we, we do need to think about uh, having a serious rainy day fund. I would look at uh, two bills, two things that recently have passed that I, I'm concerned about. Uh, one would be the high-speed rail. I'm not a fan of the, of the train, the Chili Dollar train. 
And I think this year we've spent more money on that than we have to all the Cal State universities combined. So I would really like to re reevaluate that and see if that's really where we our, prior, our best priority should be. Also, AB 32 was, was uh, California cap and trade. According to Cal Chamber, that, that one piece of legislation could cost the state over a million, a million jobs uh, before it's fully implemented. So looking at, at stuff like that in terms of, in terms of uh, do we really, is this really what we need when we have high unemployment and we have these crushing deficits uh, up at the state level, what, what can we do to, to streamline our financials? So uh, I would seriously look at those two and then, and then certainly do whatever we can to, to, uh, to promote more local control of our, of our education. That's it. Great, thanks so much. Um, on the high speed rail thing, just wondering, a show of hands, who, like Dennis, is opposed to the California High Speed Rail program? I, I, I don't think it's a it's a not a yes or no because you know it, it passed overwhelmingly. Um, the the concept was good, but then I think it was marred in in, in waste and just inefficiencies. So I think we need to take on projects like that, but they have to be the right projects and done well. So you're more in the gray area then. Um, you talked a little bit about business ideas or business policies that don't make sense now. A lot of people in the business community feel that CEQA reform is needed. Can you talk about where you stand on that issue and what you would do to balance the needs of homeowners who really feel like CEQA is the only leverage they have and businesses who want to go forward? What would you do? We'll start with you. So CEQA has been a lot of land for the last 30 years and it has accomplished a great deal in our state uh, in terms of environmental protection, in terms of transparency for projects so the communities know what's planning to be built, and can look into the environmental impact of that project and have a full uh, preview of what's going to happen. Uh, as we all know, however, there are abuses in CEQA. Uh, there are circumstances where homeowners, for example, or other residents, uh, rather than having an environmental concern specifically about a project, would just rather the project was not built at all. And there have been many examples, not predominantly, but uh, many examples, of lawsuits that have been brought specifically to prolong a process or to try to stop a project from being built. Uh, if I get up to Sacramento, I will be looking for ways that we can uh, modernize CEQA without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, we need to figure out ways to uh, make those abusive lawsuits uh, less able to prolong projects while continuing to keep the CEQA core that has done so much for our community. Yeah, I concur with a lot of that. I mean, CEQA is obviously very important to protect the environmental impact that projects have on communities. But when people start using it for a legal process to delay projects unnecessarily because they have disagreements over the project, they don't have anything to do with environmental impact, uh, we need to look at ways to curb that. Because unfortunately, we're in a position now where we need more growth. We need to build affordable housing. There's a lot of projects that could go forward that are being delayed in the valley even. And uh, we have to make sure we're doing everything possible to protect the environmental implications while also curbing frivolous lawsuits or people using CEQA just to stop projects out of uh, other reasons. So I think we're close to what Jamie said. I, I would just concur, CEQA reform is long overdue. It's, it's certainly, uh, I think we've all had experiences in, in our own communities where, where that, that's, that system has been abused. And so I would be a, a, a huge proponent of really seriously taking a look at it and reevaluating it and streamlining the process so it's more efficient and more effective and, and really to do what it's more intended to do. So I would definitely be here. Yeah, I think we need to not pit opponents against each other for one's interest in particular. But you know what a novel concept is? Bringing both sides together to the negotiating table. And you wouldn't believe how often it doesn't happen. You know, sit down, come up with a compromise. I mean, that's how you can actually get something that's moderate and a middle ground approved. So I think we need to reform it, not have it you know, be used for the wrong purposes, but then actually get something through in the end. I think this has been a debate for a while now um, in terms of reforming CEQA, and I would obviously feel the same way about making sure that we're protecting our environment and, and, and following uh, what needs to be done, but not hinder new growth, uh, new business, and uh, affordable housing and other issues. So I would wait until I got up to Sacramento and really took a look at CEQA and some of the proposals for reform. Great. Um, to continue, Andre, you talked about your LAUSD education. What can, as a state legislator, what can you do to help LAUSD? You can obviously always have a great education. Um, I had a great experience in, in, in going through LAUSD. And I have to say, my children did too. 
But you're right, it's, it's hit and miss. My daughter graduated from Cleveland High School in the humanities magnet, and it was a fantastic program. Uh, we, need, we need to have more fantastic programs throughout the state of California, and specifically in the LA Unified School District. I think the governor's local control funding formula proposal, while not a lot of people in, in our district are in favor of it, it at least begins a conversation, and it begins the realization in letting people know that some children and some communities cost more to educate. If a child comes to school hungry, if a child comes to school not knowing the language, it's gonna cost more to educate that child. And we need to figure out a way to make sure that our schools are fully funded and that all children are being educated. So it's, it's very difficult for me to speak critically about LAUSD as a whole, because my daughter uh, attends public school in LAUSD, has a terrific school, uh, and has been, just been given a terrific education. My wife is a school librarian at LAUSD as well, in another marvelous school in the San Fernando Valley. We do have an achievement gap uh, in our schools, and many of them are not up to the par of the best schools in the valley. Uh, so some of the things that I would like to do from a state standpoint are number one, let's refocus uh, a pathway for students back on apprenticeships and job training. I think many of our students are being lost by the traditional pathway of gearing them to go directly to a university after school. While it works for so many, we are losing others who want to pursue uh, different job skills and who want to be ready to be employable as soon as they graduate. Um, secondly, I would make sure that our schools were fostering a collaborative uh, experience. Uh, studies have shown that when a school is working together as a team, uh, with parents involved, with principals involved, uh, and with the teachers involved, that's the recipe for success. It's not easy to legislate, but I think it's something that we need to laser focus on. Obviously, there's no issue more important to parents than their child's education, and I think that for any legislator, that should be one of their top priorities. Um, I come from a background of that's having a single mother going through an education system, you know, I wouldn't be in a position to be in public service had I not gotten a great public education system at the higher education level with UCLA. But to get to the point where you're going to higher education, we have to have a great primary education system. That's why I want to look at Prop 98 as a floor and not a ceiling. We need to start increasing funding and make sure local level funding is getting in the hands of not just administrators, but teachers to make sure they have the decisions to make the difference in a child's life. We have so many you know, big decisions in Sacramento, but we have to make sure that primary education is our number one focus and make sure that the money that was allocated in Prop 30 is going into the right hands to make sure that primary education is always the number one focus of the state to prepare tomorrow's leaders. So looking at Prop 98 is a ceiling, not a floor. Right? Well, I have an issue's perspective is totally opposite of Dana's. Um, my mother was an LA Unified School principal for her entire career, 25 years. Uh, I sent both my daughters to uh, private to public LA Unified <coughs> elementary schools, but I, I saw what the high school, the, junior, the middle schools and high schools were like, and they were, they were more like prisons as far as I'm concerned. I know the bathrooms were just disgusting, and, and I just said I cannot send my kids there. One out of four kids in the West Valley go to a private school, and there's a reason why. And our failure of LA Unified School District is an embarrassment nationwide. We saw the paper, the article in the LA, uh, Daily News. Um, we spent so much money on, on spending on per pupil, but, but so little that turns into achievement. And our graduation rates are, what, less than 50%. I mean, it's just horrible, the results from LA Unified. And I think the best thing that we can do is break it up. I think I think more local control. Unfortunately, the unions have such a firm grip of our, of our, of our uh, education system that it's hard to make the changes that we need to make. But certainly breaking up LA Unified to have a specific value district certainly would be job number one. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we get into the weeds of the education debate, but often in the discussion, what's left out are the students and the kids. We get bogged down by all the other elements at play, but we have to remember, we have to put kids first. It's about what's happening in the classroom and educating kids, giving teachers the resources they need to properly do it. Working for the council office, we had to help a school fund a computer lab, uh, their graduation ceremony, I mean, LAUSD is just a giant bureaucracy that doesn't have its priorities straight at all. Um, but at the state level, we need to bring back adult education. LAUSD dramatically cut that. That is huge, especially in this economy. Um, we have to reduce class sizes, and we have to give the teachers the proper resources so they can do their job and educate our kids. Great, thanks. 
All right, this is just a one word answer. We'll go fast. Name one person who has too much power to call for the government. The average citizens don't have enough power. I went up to Sac. Oh, it's one word. Well, you can elaborate. I mean, we're just trying to make this natural. Oh, okay. I mean, it was just—it was quite a scene in Sacramento. I'll be very brief to see that. You know, who are the legislators interacting with on a daily basis? Lobbyists, not people. And so I think that we need to kind of reprioritize that. Same question. Oil, maybe. Northern California. Two words, but I'll. I would say lobbyists in general, and you can't blame them. It's their business. That's what they do. They do a very good job. When you see the amount of influence that's being pushed, the amount of legislation that's being driven by special interest groups, it doesn't really have the priorities for the average citizen, person from the valley. And hopefully, when you elect legislators, that they balance out, you know, being able to represent their districts and being able to withstand that kind of pressure. Certainly, as a union labor, union leaders should not be involved in negotiations for a budget being involved as much as they are. So I would say you name your union, but there's too much union and special interest involvement. That would be great. You know, obviously, we're seeing in Sacramento the economy is getting better. There's more money flowing to different departments now. As the economy gets better, what do you think was overcut during the recession on a state level, and what would you, what department would you prioritize sort of going in? You know, I think my grandmother used to say, as soon as you get some money, you have a hole in your pocket. You're ready to spend it again. So I think we can't get too comfortable. We need to be prepared for the peaks and the valleys in the economy and keep that rainy day fund. But senior care was cut. Long-term health care workers and the right amount of facilities for seniors. I was raised by my grandparents. We had to take care of my grandma who had Alzheimer's. It was very difficult. The state did not have the proper resources. Now we have the baby boomer generation retiring, and I don't see us properly prepared to be able to handle that. So I think we need to not only restore the funding to pre-recession levels, but make sure it's adequately funded and that we're prepared. Education was drastically cut. Community colleges were drastically cut. And yes, we worked hard to pass Prop 30, but all Prop 30 did was restore the cuts that we had made over the last five or six years, and we've had no growth. So I would make sure that education, especially higher education, is fully funded and that students have access. You know, I think we all, you know, pushed hard to pass Prop 30, but Prop 30 just brought us to the levels we were at in 2008. And we need to grow and we need to make sure everybody has access. I worked in the state senate and assembly during the toughest times in the budget year, and I remember Assembly Member Fewer, now our city attorney, literally staying up at night because of the excruciating cuts that they were forced to decide, whether it would be education, funding for AIDS patients, literally programs that kept people alive. So there's a lot of places that I would like to see restored. I am glad to see that the state recently returned $250 million to the UCs and CSUs, and I want to continue to grow that as well. I'm going to focus on another part, which is the judiciary. We have consolidated courtrooms in the San Fernando Valley and throughout the Southland to a truly dangerous extent. If you want to file an eviction notice or contest an eviction notice in the San Fernando Valley, you have to go to Pasadena or Santa Monica today. And if you don't have a car, you have to get there on public transportation, and you have to go back again a month later, and maybe the day after that they postpone your trial. This is unacceptable, and our judiciary is such a small percentage of the state budget that with just a little piece of the new revenues coming in, we can make restorations that allow for people to truly be able to seek justice in the Valley. Thanks. I would say that we have to be cautious of making sure we have a rainy day fund that is extending past what we have right now to ensure that if we have another downturn in the economy, we have the money there to prevent the cuts that we just saw over the last five or six years, and also higher education. I'm a product, like I said, of a UC system school, UCLA, and too often now I have interns going to high school having to go to school out of state because there's just not the room anymore. They can't get in, and if they do, their class sizes cause them to take five or six years to graduate. 
and when they leave now, their debt is at a point now where it really restricts their ability to go into certain professions. So I think we need to increase funding for scholarships. Uh, what the speaker did with the middle class family scholarship is a great first step, but we need to make sure we freeze tuition costs at our Cal States and UCs, look for more opportunities to provide uh, scholarships and grants and work study programs. Uh, so not only do we have a world class public education system, but it's affordable and accessible to all children in California. I work a lot with senior citizens, and I think we really need to do a better job at, at preventing elder abuse and, and tightening our rules and regulations regarding um, you know, some of the stuff that's going on in terms of uh, taking advantage or fraud of elders. Uh, but in terms of, uh, I saw a bump the other day, so the, the bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. I think that applies to our state government. And I, I really think that uh, if you look at over the last three, four decades, how much our budget and how much our spending has grown, I think if we have a little extra money, we should, we should be giving that back to the taxpayers or setting it aside in a rainy day fund to cover those times. But, our revenues go down. So really, uh, I'd be a fan of not adding back anything and just maybe really evaluate is trying to become more efficient and, and eliminate a lot of the, the bureaucracy and the waste that's in our state government. Um, you guys all talked about jobs being a top priority. We'll start with you, Matt. You, you know, work in, you were in Sherman's office, so you understand the hurdles to job creation. What What is the biggest hurdle and what is one of your ideas to overcome that? You know, I don't think it's just one issue. It's not just taxes. It's not just regulatory reform issues. It's not just CEQA stuff. It's the whole climate. I think, you know, in terms of the film industry, you know, we have a $100 million tax credit that we provide to the film industry. New York provides $400 million. We give it to 31 projects out of almost 400 that apply. The rest of the projects are going to go to other states. You know, it's about having a business climate that protects our environment, is a supporter of labor laws, but also realizes we have to grow the economy and create jobs. So, you know, looking at these regulations to make sure that we're giving businesses flexibility to hire new people and making sure that we have an economy that's growing out from the middle. So, I would say that there's a lot of regulations we need to take a look at. There's some tax structures that we need to take a look at. But overall, I think it's just having a climate and having the priorities in Sacramento that reflect the fact that we have to start growing the economy. And to do that, you have to create businesses. And to create businesses, you have to have a climate that's competitive with other states. So, does that mean changing the climate? How would you change I think there's not just one answer, but I think there's a lot of regulations we need to look at. Why are we less competitive in Texas? Why are we less competitive in Nevada? Why are we losing film production to New Mexico and to Oregon? So I think there's you know, one silver bullet answer I don't have for you, but I think you know one reason is I think uh, the cost of living in California is always very high, but when you couple that with uh, business costs, and then you look at how much it takes in terms of uh, regulatory issues, I mean, it just adds up one after another. So we have to start looking at how we can be more competitive with other states. Well, uh, certainly uh, California's doing a horrible job in terms of in terms of trying to encourage jobs. We, we charge $800 a year to have a corporation in, ca in California. Even if you have zero revenue, we still charge $800 a year. Nevada, zero. Um, uh, Nevada has no state income tax. Texas, Alaska, Florida, many states have no state income tax at all. We have the highest sales tax in the country. We have the highest gasoline tax in the country. Uh, what can we do to attract jobs is we can really look at, at our government. Why does California, which has 11% of the population, pay 33% of all the welfare in the country? Does that make sense? I don't, I don't know. But certainly I think that, uh, that we, we need to really focus on, on making businesses our top priority. And some of this job-killing legislation that's been coming out of Sacramento is it's good examples of, of what we need to really look at and reform and evaluate what is more important, jobs or the environment, whatever else it is, we need to really focus on that. So I, I would really seriously look at those things that are killing jobs. Not only do we have a punitive tax code, but I think we have an unfair and unpredictable business culture of overregulation. The California Small Business Roundtable put out a study that said we are the we're rated the worst state in the country for unanticipated and overregulation. Um, and so, how are you going to create not only a welcoming environment but a stable environment for the businesses that are here? So, yes, the filming industry is a top priority to help build this state. New York's got a $500 million subsidy. We're nowhere near there. So we have to not only compete to bring them back, but to make them thrive. For existing businesses, we held a, with the council office, a small business roundtable with the Board of Equalization. And there are so many tax incentives and breaks that we can take advantage of now that people don't know about. Um, and I think it's just yeah, cutting some of the roadblocks that are currently on the books. So not only do we need to make California more business friendly, 
but we also need a trained workforce. We need to make sure we have people that are trained, willing, and able to do the jobs if there are jobs available, if more business comes to California and if we grow. I have two college-aged children. Actually, one of them is over college age, but is uh, still figuring out his major back and forth. Um, but I know lots of kids who graduated this year in 2013 with fancy degrees from fantastic universities, and they have no jobs. They do not have any marketable skills. They don't know what a work ethic is. And I think we need to do a better job, not only of attracting more businesses and being able to make it easier for businesses to come here and business owners to open shop, but we also need a trained workforce. We need to start in middle school. We need to make sure that we're giving kids options, that we're not just gearing everyone toward a four-year degree and, oh, if you're not gonna get a four-year degree, I don't know what you're gonna do. Because these kids are graduating with no skills. I think the number one reason businesses leave this state is, is hassle. They're just tired of so many regulations being drooped on top of them, and simply a lack of respect uh, coming from Sacramento and coming from their local leaders that don't seem to understand how important it is to start small businesses and how difficult it is to keep businesses going. So there's a couple of specific things that I'd like to do. Uh, I will support legislation cracking down on abusive lawsuits. Uh, Prop 65 is a perfect example. Uh, this is a very well-intentioned and very valuable initiative that unfortunately in protecting water and protecting uh, people from carcinogens has led to a wide spate of abusive lawsuits based simply on whether a particular sign was put up at a particular shop at a particular location. Um, I want to make sure that we are sensibly uh, looking at regulations and not in a way that breaks the back of business. Also want to speak briefly about the film and TV tax credit. I came to Los Angeles to work in film and television worked here for five years uh, at companies like Nickelodeon Movies. I want to expand that credit to include broadcast television uh, and to make films with bigger budgets eligible. Just a quick follow-up, since you did work in Sacramento, Bob, yes. what's stopping the state from giving out, increasing the tax credit to compete with New York? Uh, well, we did start the tax credit. In fact, my boss, Councilmember Paul Corian, when he was in the state assembly, introduced and passed for the first time the tax credit here in the state. There's a lot of momentum to continue that credit because we have seen in the last few years uh, that it's actually bringing the state back more money than it costs the state in tax credits. It's always difficult to pass a tax credit at the start because the question is, is it going to come back? Now we have the evidence to show that it has. And if it's benefiting our budget and it's benefiting what is our most signature industry in the state, then I believe we need to expand it and I'll work with Raul Bocanegra, Adrina Zarian, and many local uh, members who want to continue to see that expanded and save that industry. Um, we're going to turn now to all of you who I'm sure have questions, so if you just want to raise your hands or stand up, whatever is easier. Uh, yeah, my name is Ken May, I work with folks with uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities. I'm wondering from you guys what your uh, experience is with and understanding is with respect to closing the developmental centers to be able to save the state significant dollars to be able to bring these individuals out into the community with support. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would support obviously reopening those centers and making sure that there is support for folks with disabilities and making sure that we have you have jobs and other opportunities. Um, I, I think it's terrible. I think when you're in the, the state legislature, you know, like Damian said, sometimes making those hard decisions of do I cut this program so that I can fund this program is, is a tough one. And um, what what I would do when I get to Sacramento, and I think why I'm best qualified, I'm a faculty member at Glendale College, and I have to represent oftentimes the interests of faculty and students. But I'm also the director of government relations. And oftentimes I'm in Sacramento lobbying for the district. And the district and the board don't always see to eye to eye with faculty, staff, and students. So what I do is I bring consensus. And I would try to make sure that your voices are heard in Sacramento as well. And I think I, I'm able to see both sides and able to come to some consensus on those issues. Both on the state and on the local side. Uh, I've worked extensively uh, with organizations and centers that help the developmentally disabled, uh, including ARC, Valley Village, uh, Tierra del Sol. 
Um, I absolutely agree. We need to create opportunities for folks to live as independently as they can. Um, and if that means the funding needs to come from the state to help people be able to live uh, in their homes rather than at a center, if they're able to do that, uh, that's going to help save the state money in the long run, and it's going to lead to a better lives for those individuals. Uh, we see so many of these opportunities. In-home health services is another one uh, where uh, seniors, typically seniors, uh, who are cared for in their homes um, end up saving the state money because they don't end up uh, in a senior center or an institution that costs more money to care for them. Uh, when we cut back on these programs, it's penny wise but pound foolish. And I'll be a fighter in Sacramento to help people live as independently as they can and save the state money at the same time. Thank you, sir. I'd agree with most of what uh, my colleagues and opponents up here have been saying. I, I think we need to do a better job of the state prioritizing uh, for the social services that have been cut in the last five or six years to reinvest in making sure groups like Valley Village and Terra del Sol have the resources available to them to allow people to live independently and be productive. And we've seen so many times when I visit there for Congressman Sherman, the work that's being done there and the ability for their contributions going back into society. So anything we can do to increase funding to give people an opportunity to live independently ends up saving the state money. And uh, I'd be a real advocate for that. Yeah, I would just con concur. I, I grew up right around the corner from New Horizons in North Hills, and they did a great job of, of uh, providing jobs for handicapped uh, individuals. And so we, we need to really, I, I agree with everything that's already said, we need to focus on, on our priorities and what's right, what's wrong, and uh, and strengthen the ADA if necessary and any other legislation that we that is necessary to, to make uh, um, make it more you know productive and more easy, more efficient <coughs> for our relationship, our state government with, with, uh, with individuals that have handicapped and the, yeah, I mean, a cut to those kinds of resources is unacceptable. I think it's a lack of leadership, and it's a lack of not having priorities straight. I want to go on listening tours, both in the campaign if I, and if I have the fortunate opportunity to get elected, so that that doesn't happen before you've not had a chance to meet with me. Just out of curiosity, did you have a chance to meet with your elected officials prior to that happening? Yeah, actually, we worked with Bob Lindenfield. By the way, I'm Ken Lane from the Adult Skills Center. The programs you mentioned are great, too, but I should probably <laughs> say that uh, we are attached to the Adult Skills Center. And Bob Lindenfield is a strong supporter of the kinds of things that we're looking for, closing developmental centers that is costing the state millions and millions of dollars to be able to get these individuals out into the community. With the support from you know from programs like you described, in programs like TASP, and he was a great, a great advocate for that. Well, I want to give you my cell phone so we can connect, but I want to proactively get to you before anything comes down the pipeline that's negatively impacted. No, that'd be great. Thank you. Who else has a question? This hit the news a couple days ago, but just looking on my phone, it happened back in June. If you had thirty million dollars to give to LAUSD, one spot. Obviously, iPads is the flavor of the day. <laughs> Where would you put that $30 million? And it could be a general thing, after school facilities. But if you had that money, what would you do? Uh, I want to ask LAUSD teachers what their number of priority is. I want to put it into the classroom. I think nothing's more important than <coughs> giving teachers the resources they need uh, to be able to teach uh, kids not just a test, but to teach them to be able to go to higher education or vocational skills or be able to be productive members of society. So I want to ask classroom teachers what they think the number one priority is for that $30 million. But I'd like to see it stay in the classroom, not go to administrator or bureaucratic uh, services. $30 million is like throwing a, a paddle at the ocean mm -hmm. when you're talking about Ellen Unified. That is nothing. Okay, that wouldn't even reach state nurses. You know, we don't have any health care on our, our schools, right? We don't have any enrichment. There's nothing going on for physical education. Okay, I mean, $30 million, unfortunately, we're talking about 700,000 plus students is not enough to make a difference, unfortunately. But I would focus on one of those, rather than you know salaries for, for you know uh, for employees or something like that or administrative. I would send it definitely back to just getting a nurse back in the campus. You know, I'll, I'll play with your hypothetical, <laughs> saying that it's a re recurring thirty million. But I think <laughs> on, on all sides of the education debate, no matter what perspective you're coming from, it's reducing class size is a huge priority. That's what I'm. I think I would put money into enrichment. I mean, we have no music, no art, very little PE, and I would want to bring those programs back because it's proven that those programs actually enhance the learning and the educational process. 
at all levels. So 30 million isn't very much money, but that's what I would do with it. Uh, to, yeah, to the extent that this is a repeating uh, fund and not a one-time money, uh, I would also invest in smaller class sizes. Uh, just as a personal example, my daughter told me uh, a couple months ago that she loves to jump rope. She wasn't able to go jump roping on the playground because they didn't have her jump rope station available. They rotate the kids to different sections at playtime because they don't have the staff to come out and watch them on the, the entire playground. Uh, Smaller class sizes is a great example of something that uh, we see in a lot of private schools and a lot of charter schools. We should be doing it more at LAUSD uh, because parents feel more comfortable, because teachers are more able to give individual time to students, uh, and because those students then uh, don't feel like they're swamped in the classroom. So it's a high priority for me. Uh, Kevin Tamaki from AT&T. We're a technology company. How would you use technology to do better by your constituents, to reach your constituents, to allow them to get their sentence known to you as flat legislator. And the Sacramento Valley is a real economic engine in terms of technology. How would you improve that as a legislator in Sacramento? Well, I, I, I would absolutely understand. We have had such huge advances in technology, especially if you look 10 years, 20 years ago, three years ago. Um, there's a huge opportunity to to be more efficient in terms of communicating with our with the constituents of the district, but also uh, getting the word out and and uh, outreach and, and uh, you know, people don't even know what the assembly does. That's quite frankly, 90% of the of the registered voters in this district are not going to vote on September 17th. That's a sad state of, of affairs. And I think with technology, there's you know there's there's the answer. We can have online voting. I mean, we can have uh, voting on Saturdays. We can we can do things with technology that other countries do already. That we are, we're, we're literally, you know, behind the times. And so I, I'm excited about technology. We Silicon Valley is in California, and we have a lot of opportunity. We just don't take advantage of it. And so I would, I would definitely do everything I could to take advantage of what's out there. Well, Kevin, I would use my AT&T cell phone <laughs> and my AT&T <laughs> cable. I like that. And my, good start. Um, I, I think. Um, <laughs> the, 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 best, the best use of technology is connecting with constituents. When I'm going door to door right now, uh, precinct walking, most people say, who is my state assembly member and what do they do? Mm -hmm. So I think connecting with constituents, priority one with the use of technology, video conferencing, good old fashioned door to door service and meetings, but I think being able to connect with constituents, video conferencing, an app um, would be great. I'd have to ask my kids, actually. <laughs> my daughter had to set up the Facebook for me. But I think we can be doing so much more with technology. I mean, I'm new. I'm a new iPhone user now. I think we can do more with texting, with video conferencing. I think we can reach constituents faster and easier if we can communicate with them that way. I think we need to meet people where they are as far as their technological needs. Um, and I think on a personal level, I can do better. I mean, I text. And I Skype, but I don't do much else. And I think there's a lo there are a lot of resources out there, and I mean, obviously you know, being with AT and T, that we could be taking better advantage of, and we could save money as well. I mean, just campaigning. If we did just a campaign using social media and electronic devices, I think that would be we would be more efficient and save money at the same time. Uh, I absolutely agree uh, that we need to improve technology in government, and I've worked to improve technology in government. Uh, when I was the lead staffer for a joint committee on government reform uh, between the State Assembly and the State Senate, uh, put together a website soliciting opinions from constituents about how that reform should be brought about. Because strangely enough, the government isn't always good at reforming itself without input from the outside. Uh, we also, uh, in Councilmember Corian's office, uh, staged many, many uh, uh, meetings about neighborhood councils where we solicited ex an extraordinary amount of input online. We have many, many people, uh, Jill amongst them, uh, who submitted uh, suggestions for how to improve the neighborhood council system and how to uh, really improve uh, both the funding and the efficiency of that system. Um, additionally, in Councilmember Kerkorian's office, we've got an app uh, where you can take a photograph 
uh, of your pothole. It tracks the GPS of that pothole, and it sends it immediately to CD2, uh, where uh, we could then send out Bureau of Street Services to fill up that pothole. There are so many things that we can do. We need to think big. We need to have people in government who understand how that technology works and how it can be built to work I agree with a lot of what uh, my opponents are saying today, but I think that, you know, the one thing is that every elected official should use technology to make themselves more accessible to their constituents. But as a state, we need to start looking at how we can make technology uh, more available to everyone. I think we need to look at making more cities where they have Wi-Fi zones. I know Riverside's in the process of making the whole city, you know, uh, Wi-Fi. We need to look at in the valley where we can have more Wi-Fi zones that allow people to use portable devices, uh, not just in a Starbucks, but when they're out in a park or when they're just walking down the street. So we need to look for ways to work with communication companies like AT&T to do that. Also, we need to look at the bureaucracy. How can we make services more streamlined and uh, use technology to help uh, constituents, uh, whether it's a DMV or state licensing boards, uh, use technology to their benefit and not have to go through the bureaucratic mess. I'm very lucky to be endorsed by Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, who's been a real pioneer in technology issues. He wrote a book, Citizenville, on how we can use technology to make government more efficient and accessible to individuals. So those are my ideas on it. Great. Thank you. Uh, what would you each do to protect business and homeowners, of, uh, and particularly the most important tax uh, item that we have, that's Prop 13? Yeah. Um, you know, I would defend Prop 13. I think you know any kind of drastic change would be totally devastating to the economy. I think we can start to form a working group with all the interests, um, with all the various stakeholders, and find out how we can make this sustainable long term. Um, but I think uh, it's an important thing to have in our state, and we protect it. Yeah, I support. Uh protecting long-time property owners, long-time homeowners, and uh, long-time business owners. Uh, uh, if I am elected, the residential side of Prop 13 will be off the table. Uh, the business side of Prop 13, you will not see changes in rates. Uh, I am interested in looking at uh, closing a loophole that allows businesses that change hands to not uh, be reassessed for their property taxes. It's unfair to the rest of us uh, business and residential uh, who have our, our taxes reassessed when we purchase a new property, and I want to make that fair uh, throughout the state. Uh, one of the side effects of Prop 13 that has a big impact on our, on our communities is how much of state money now gets filtered up through Sacramento before it comes back to a local community. Um, in protecting homeowners, which was a very laudable goal and something that uh, we need to protect, we also took a lot of community control away in a way that I think to the original voters didn't understand was going to happen. So I want to look for more ways for us to be able to raise revenue locally, uh, like the Measure R uh, uh, initiative that passed in the county, brought lots of funding to terrific local transportation projects, uh, so that Sacramento is not deciding how our money uh, gets spent. Obviously, for homeowners, they understand how important Prop 13 is in protecting uh, their big investment, but obviously, as businesses, obviously important to protect Prop 13 too, to make sure we keep a competitive business climate. I would agree with Damien though, there have been some abuses to that uh, with businesses, and especially corporations that have changed hands and worked out deals where they've been able to keep the same tax rate, even though it's clear that there's a new owner or at least a new group with ownership. So we need to look at making sure there's a fair playing field, but making sure we protect Prop 13 should be a priority for every legislator. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, w I, was, uh, I ran for this office three years ago, and I was endorsed by the Howard Jarvis uh, Taxpayers Association. And, uh, and they are trying to protect, and I, and I do believe that we should protect both sides, both the residential and the business side. If the business is taxed too higher, they're just going to pass it on to the consumers. We all know that. The median house in West San Fernando Valley is probably around half a million dollars. The sales, the property tax is one and a quarter percent of that. So if you buy a house, the median house in West San Fernando Valley, you're paying about $500 a month just in property taxes alone. And uh, we've seen, as realtors, I've seen that many uh, uh, buyers just, you know, uh, look at the property taxes and not be able to afford to be able to buy a house just because of what the property taxes are, and then it goes up every year. So, so I would be very much an advocate of keeping the property 13 intact as much as we possibly can. Back there. 
Hi, uh, my name is Diane Duke. I'm the CEO of the Free Speech Coalition. It's the trade association for the Adult Entertainment and Products Association. So my question is, if you are elected, our industry is very vital in this community. We're actually a strong part of the community. We contribute to the community, to California, with living wages, jobs, issues that you're talking about. Would, if you were elected, would you be willing to be an advocate, go to bat for the adult entertainment industry? And also, as you start talking about tax credits for the filming industry, understanding that there's a filming industry um, with the adult industry as well. Right, and maybe you could weigh in too on as the adult industry is actually left the San Fernando Valley following the production. Yes, I would say that I'm going to start with the audience. Yes, I would absolutely be an advocate, and I was absolutely upset and when the, not upset, that's the wrong word. <laughs> um, when the industry left because of the regulations for quantum use, and now they're, I guess, in Ventura County now. And it's not gonna be long before they're just out of California altogether. Um, so yes, I would be a strong advocate. Thank you. Is there any way to follow up? I mean, how do you balance the sort of social issues that the city wants to regulate and, and sort of be on that side with the business practices? I mean, of course, obviously it's very liberal with the council. Right, right. Um, you know what, I think that there are some issues that government should not be involved in, and that's one of them. I mean, I, I think then that opens the door for government to be involved in every issue and, and, and all the ways that we do business and, they, and, and want to regulate everything in business. Yes, there's a health and safety issue, and yes, we have to just be um, confident and, and understand that the industry and that the companies are taking precaution and that they're hiring you know, employees who also are taking proper precautions. And that really should be left up to the business and to the industry and should not be interfered with by government regulation. And that's how I feel about that. I think the adult entertainment industry is a perfect example of an industry that has effectively self-regulated. Uh, I, I would like to see more of this. Um, when an industry says we have some potential controversy, we have some potential health issues, we have some potential working issues, but we are going to take the responsible steps to make sure that employees are taken care of uh, and that we are implementing regulations to do so, but then the government doesn't have the need to step in and impose those regulations on the industry. Uh, unfortunately, that isn't the case in every industry. Um, but you know, despite uh, any social controversy or what have you, I don't believe that the government uh, should be getting uh, involved in industries based on a sort of code of morality. Um, and as it happens, the adult entertainment industry has done a very good job of protecting the health and safety of its workers uh, in the last couple of decades. I think this was an overreach. Uh, it's something that I would continue to monitor because industries can change. Um, but we should be applauding uh, when jobs are protected and workers are protected proactively uh, and the government doesn't have to step in. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. I think I would concur with that. That um, you know, this is just one more example of cities and state government, you know, overregulating where there's a situation that where there wasn't a huge problem to begin with, and uh, driving an industry that's important for tax base and jobs out of our area. Um, so we need to look at ways that we can give that power back to local businesses to decide how they can best regulate themselves. Obviously, we need to make sure we're protecting workers. We need to make sure we're uh, thinking about bigger health implications, uh, but in this regard, I think we need to look at the overall impact and the cost-benefit analysis, and I think that uh, uh, we need to make sure that we're protecting industries that are providing the tax base for all the services that we want to make sure we keep uh, and, and have an opportunity to not drive out businesses from the city or the state. Ted Franklin, I just want to add, I've known Mitch Englander for like 20 years, and I definitely disagree with him on, on this issue about the condom use, and, and I think it's really severely impacted uh, the jobs in Chatsworth and North Valley, and so I, I'm very disappointed to see see that uh, decision go through. But that's a that's a local decision, not a state assembly type of decision. So that's something that, as state assembly people, we probably wouldn't be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But your question, which is important, goes to the core theme of why I'm here today. The state, the city government, does not have its priorities straight. We just heard about all the various issues that are affecting all of our lives from business to education to senior care, and we're taking the time to regulate that. While we do have to monitor it and make sure that it's safe and healthy, we have to make sure it can prosper, but we need to focus on the right priorities and get them straight. I mean, 
we have to make sure Damien's daughter can jump rope. <laughs> I was picturing her there. I mean, that, we, need to, we need to fund education. We need to have proper funding to senior care to make sure our seniors are taken care of. We have to get rid of the burden that's on your businesses and, and create an environment in which you can thrive. That's what we need to focus on. Another question about I'm here with the Hospital Association of Southern California. You know, I've heard a lot of discussion about work, you know, workforce and investments in education in terms of creating that pipeline for the workforce. And though, needless to say, there is a shortage of allied folks in the healthcare setting. You know, we need radiologists, pharmacists, you name it, and respiratory therapists or such uh, individuals that we need. But I'm curious to get your perspective in terms of what if one thing that you can do to the Medi-Cal program preparation for health care reform. As you know, October 1st, people will start enrolling in the exchange for the switch to a live you know, January 1st. And so I'm interested in hearing your ideas of what one thing that you would do to the Medi-Cal program that you could to make this a successful effort in 2014. And I guess I open that to it. Yeah, of course. So I would start with notification. Uh, there's a big education gap uh, among people may be covered by the Medi-Cal expansion and by the new uh, insurance exchange. They're totally unaware, and I've found this in walking precincts by talking to people who told me about their health issues, and it's very clear that they're eligible for these programs and they don't know that they're coming online. Uh, we need to redouble our efforts in getting the word out through local assembly offices, uh, through uh, the county departments, uh, through the state departments, uh, in having a real concerted education process uh, to let people know that they can sign up for these programs. Uh, Republicans nationwide have made, frankly, an effort to try to block people from not only signing up for individual insurance coverage, but from even understanding how the system works. They sent a letter critical of uh, the NFL for daring to say that they might try to use part of their uh, holy pulpit to let people know how they can sign up. We need to do the opposite in this state. We need to be working with every a public and private interest uh, that, that has a stake in seeing this implemented and get the word out to people how they can get help. Yeah, I also think, you know, making sure that uh, residents of the Valley know what programs are available and how to sign up and who's eligible and who's not. We're also working with businesses to know the impact of the new law. Uh, we recently, Congressman Sherman's office with uh, HHS and local state regulators hosted a town hall forum in the North Valley to make sure businesses were prepared and were able to be participants in the program to know how to inform their employees and to know what's gonna happen in the next couple months. So making sure individuals and businesses are prepared for what's coming I think will be uh, a big advantage not only to the state in terms of implementing the program but also to individuals that need the care. I, I would just add that uh, I know a lot of people are anticipating a train wreck. I really honestly hope that does not happen when, they, when the Affordable Care Act is enacted. Uh, I'm really concerned about doctors. Uh, they're, they're, uh, a lot of people have great relationships with their existing doctors, and, and uh, they don't know, they're not aware of, they don't know, but we're seeing, uh, um, unfortunately, doctors withdrawing from participation, and I think that's that's a big uh, problem. I think we need to address that specifically uh, with, with doctors and, and do whatever we can, provide whatever incentives uh, to get them to participate and be part of the, uh, of the program. So, um, I, like I said, I'm, my fingers are crossed. It's, uh, it's a huge you know, uh, government takeover of a, a very large part of, of our economy. And I, I really hope it succeeds, because obviously we do need, uh, we do need to address uh, health care issues in this country. But Medicaid is basically broke, and so uh, our California system is, is, doesn't have much viability long term. So I'm just crossing my fingers and hope that it isn't a train wreck. That's all. I mean, I think it's a core function of the state to make sure people are taken care of and have the health care they need. Um, I've, I've heard feedback, for example, from dentists, is one specific group. Both my dentist, Dr. Barry Herman in Tarzana, and Dr. Irving Leibovix from the Dental Association, they're having the most difficult time getting reimbursement from Medi-Cal, and they feel like they're having to you know, perform charity work because it's totally killing their businesses. So I think that's a huge priority when the Affordable Health Care Act gets implemented to make sure that they are getting reimbursed so they don't have to shut their doors forever. And then also I think um, as many workshops and town halls that we can do and outreach to let people know what's coming and what to expect. I think communication is key with healthcare professionals <coughs> and with constituents in, in the Valley and obviously throughout California. 
I also think it's important to make sure that workshops are held and maybe we have task force leaders in all the communities so that people understand what, what the healthcare program looks like and that they're not losing services if they were on Medi-Cal and now they're part of the exchange or, or what have you. So uh, my fear with that is that there, there may be some services that they were getting before that now they're not gonna get anymore and we need to make sure that, that people are aware of what's covered and what's not covered and make sure that they understand exactly how that's all gonna work. And I think people are gonna need help applying as well and figuring out how do I enroll in this program? What is it all about? And who's gonna help me get through the bureaucracy of making sure that I'm insured and I have my health care? Um, I was gonna interrupt and ask one question. On a scale of like A, B, C, D, E, a grade, how would you grade uh, Jerry Brown, Governor Jerry Brown, and what have you liked that he's done recently? What disappointed you? Um, I mean, I would give him uh, A minus. Mm -hmm. I think he's done a great job of turning around his reputation of Governor Moonbeam. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's really trying to be an independent voice. They just passed and he signed the uh, manufacturing incentive to take good tax breaks to new manufacturing. But at the same time, he's making sure that our environment's protected. So I think it's a good balance. Um, I think he could do a little bit better job of reaching out to all stakeholders. I heard sometimes that doesn't happen as, as best as it should. So open lines of communication, very important. But overall, pretty decent job. As a teacher, um, actually I would give Jerry Brown an A. I think he's done a great job. I think he's um, brave, for one thing, and he's, he's not afraid of not being reelected, and he's not afraid of making hard choices. I think the one thing that I'm disappointed in, I, I mean, there are a few things that I'm disappointed in, um, and I'm not grading him on all of his decisions. This is an overall grade of A. I'm disappointed in what he's done with adult education, um, because adult education has been eliminated from a lot of the K-12 schools, and it's very important. We do adult ed, and we do a good job at Glendale College, but not all community colleges are in proximity to those who need adult education. So that was a big disappointment for me on a personal level as well. Uh, I think the governor's done a terrific job, particularly on the budget front. Um, just a few years ago, who could have imagined that this year we would not only be out of deficit in the state, but we would literally have a surplus and that the major debate in Sacramento would be how much of a surplus do we really have and should we think about filling in our uh, programs that were cut or putting it into a reserve. Um, so I give him a tremendous amount of credit for, sh for spearheading the difficult choices uh, that had to be made to balance that budget. Uh, I will say that there are some priorities that I wish he was focused on a little bit more. One of them is the ACA. Uh, you know, we're getting so many of these uh, regulations and, and moves coming out at the end of the game here uh, that while the legislature has done a terrific job in responding to expanding Medi-Cal uh, and making sure that we are using all the federal funds available to us uh, to expand health care, um, I think the governor uh, at, at this point needs to really get on top of that and make sure that uh, he is doing the implementation necessary uh, to make that program work really well. Yeah, I would definitely give it an A. I think if you look at where we were four years ago as a state, with our budget, with cuts to social services, with just a general, general direction of where the state was going, uh, I think he's brought a steady hand. I think he's given uh, a lot of clarity to issues. Uh, you know, even in things like a workers' compensation reform and now with a pension reform, he's uh, shown, I think, an independent streak. I think uh, considering where we were four years ago, it's hard not to give him an A. That doesn't mean I've agreed with every decision. Uh, that he's done, like free enterprise, excuse me, uh, economic enterprise zones, but I do think overall he, uh, he definitely deserves an A. Well, I'd give him a B, E minus, something like that. Um, uh, he's done, Governor Brown is, is experienced now, I and mean, he's really learned a lot, and I think that's a great asset that we have. He's a breath of fresh air compared to our previous governor, Schwarzenegger. So I would give him credit for that, but uh, I was really disappointed that uh, what he did do on pension reform was, was very small and, and, and uh, not really enough to make much of a difference. I mean, there's a lot of abuses in terms of spiking and, and other things like that. Uh, the budget, although balanced, um, is, is lacking any type of infrastructure change or structural changes in terms of paying back the $100 million we borrowed from the federal government to pay to extend unemployment benefits. It doesn't deal with anything about uh, the unfunded pension liabilities and the health care liabilities that we promised to our, our employees that we have really no way of paying back. And so, and so uh, in terms of uh, can he make a difference, will he make a difference, you know, I think the jury's still out. Uh, what kind of legacy he'll have, uh, I, I don't know. But uh, I was in Sacramento last, last week, and 
the portrait that he has from back like, the 70s, whatever, is awful. I just hope the new one or the next one will be a lot better. Than that. That's all. Well, I think we're going to start wrapping things up. Is there any other questions from the audience? Well, you all talked about support for education and higher education. You talked about K-12, and Andrew, you're the only one to talk about pre-K. <coughs> I'm Mike Walnick. I'm from the Child Care Resource Center. And over the last four years, uh, state funding for early childhood child care has been cut by about 50%. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've, got, we've taken a bigger cut than education has taken. And we're a workforce support as well as an early learning support. And I wondered what your all position could be on restoring some of the early childhood funds that have been lost. Yeah, I'm 100% in favor of restoring those funds. I, as a mom, as a single mom, uh, child care was important to me. Preschool was very important to me. And like Michael said, not just uh, for my children, but so that I could actually be in the workforce. I ran a Welfare to Work AmeriCorps program when I first started at Glendale College um, focused on early childhood education. And what the program did was recruit women from the community who had never been to school and put them through a two-year program where they earned their early childhood education certificate and were transitioned from Welfare to Work as preschool teachers. And part of their service was going into the Head Start preschools and um, improving the literacy skills of the kids in preschool. And that program was funded both by the state and by the federal government in terms of AmeriCorps. And I would want to see more programs like that brought back. And I would want to see expansion for child care and pre-K programs. Yeah, uh, I, I think I'm the only candidate up here who has uh, a little girl who's about to enter a uh, pre-K program. Uh, and my older daughter uh, also attended a terrific LAF program that really prepared her for kindergarten. There's really no better way spend our money in an early childhood education. Uh, it has enormous impacts on uh, education, on crime rates, uh, on health of children, if they are able to uh, be able to experience uh, learning the skills necessary uh, to go on to kindergarten and, and be ready to learn on day one. Uh, in fact, I went out and personally advocated uh, a month ago before the first 5LA board uh, who were considering a 10% cut to our LAF uh, programs here in the county and I came and testified in front of them uh, to let them know how important these programs were, not just to my own family, but to so many families in the area. Uh, this is a, an opportunity we should be expanding to more children. Um, and if I am elected, I will be searching for ways to do exactly that. Yeah, I think the research is clear that uh, early childhood education uh, makes a huge difference in the life of that child as they go into adulthood and through their whole educational process. Uh, we should be doing everything possible as a state to increase funding for programs and uh, make sure every child has an opportunity to get early childhood education before they start uh, preschool. Yeah, and, and uh, just uh, to be brief, I, I would absolutely agree. I mean, uh, I have two daughters, and one's a junior in college, and the other one's entering 11th grade. And uh, we both, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, were very adamant that they take, uh, take advantage of the pre-K uh, uh, education, and uh, I think that has a huge difference down the road. That it's, it's, there's just no question. So whatever we can do to to, uh, to enforce that and reinforce that and fund that, I'm all very much in favor. Yeah, and, and thank you for what you do. I mean, you have the power, we all have the power with our vote, with our decision, what we do, to affect a human being's life um, for the better or the worse. So I think it's extremely important and vital that you get the funding. Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Just a quick question. Um, last week, the trial lawyers filed an initiative with the Attorney General's office um, that would change MICRA, the Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act of 1975. Interesting enough, Governor Brown was governor at that time as well. <laughs> so I'd like to know what your position is with regard to that potential initiative. It still needs to qualify for the November 2014 ballot. What is your position in terms of the one provision of that uh, initiative that would increase the non-economic cap, injury cap, from 250000 to more than $1.2 million. Who wants to start with that one? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to start. Uh, yeah, so micro is an issue that uh, when you walk into Sacramento, you are immediately asked by everybody in the room, how do you feel about micro? So mm -hmm. this is my position. Um, I believe that, first of all, does everybody know what micro does? Yes. Okay, I'll, can I have 
five seconds for an explanation. Uh, it basically caps pain and suffering damages uh, for medical malpractice suits at $250,000, and the cap has remained the same since Michael was passed into law in the 1970s. Um, uh, other types of damages, particularly economic damages, uh, are not capped under MICRA, and there are a number of other things that it did uh, to help um, protect uh, those who are sued by patients. Um, my belief is that this is a cap that, uh, um, making this a, a, a nominal sum, a sum that doesn't change over time, is not the best way to serve justice. Uh, so I would like to see this cap uh, raise and lower with inflation um, as it goes up to make this a sort of a stable cap in dollars. Uh, I'm not a supporter of immediately raising the cap from 250,000 to 1.2 million. I think that's too big of a jump and does want, and is a jump that would particularly um, at a time when we're implementing ACA, um, really bring some danger to access uh, to healthcare in the state. So uh, it's a nuanced position. It, it's certainly not one that uh, you know hardcore micro no changes ever would support. Uh, but I do think that this initiative is an overreach. I think that uh, when you look at states that don't have programs like micro, and you see the results of doctors going without liability insurance. So patients that have uh, grievance can't sue for anything. Or you have whole counties in New York that don't have OBGYNs because they're afraid to practice. And then you have a situation where you have most doctors who will tell you, this will change the way they practice medicine. If micro is drastically changed, they'll become much more defensive. They won't want to do certain operations. Certain populations will get far less care. Um, there's a real broad coalition actually surrounding micro, including Planned Parenthood, because some of the biggest losers in this debate will be uh, inner city clinics, uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, the least among us will actually suffer the most. So uh, it's, I think, very important to protect MICRA in terms of uh, the debate right now uh, with ACA. When you're adding 2.5 million people to the healthcare system, anything that's going to discourage people from staying in the healthcare field or doctors from practicing, I think, is a huge risk. But also, we need to look at the long term consequences of what this will do to hospitals, uh, clinics, and overall care. And I think we need to take a real broad risk approach to making sure that this proposition is looked at fully too, because there's some other stuff in there in terms of uh, how it affects doctors. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, micro as well. Yeah, I, I would just uh, stipulate that I'm against. I, I think that uh, malpractice insurance is already too expensive as it is, and, and uh, doing things that to, you know contain some of the abuses that we've seen in terms of lawsuits is, is a good thing. So uh, I'm against uh, the legislation, but. Uh, but I would say, same, similarly, uh, no, I'm, a, I'm in favor of no-fault insurance, like auto insurance, you know? If you look at, uh, you know, how much an accident costs and all that kind of stuff, I, I do think that uh, for some reason in California, that's, that hasn't, that the trial lawyers have, have successfully defeated that every time. But certainly, uh, you know, if you get in a car accident and uh, and uh, your insurance covers your costs and the insurance covers their costs, that's really going to lessen the cost of auto insurance across the board. So for both those things, I, I, I favor leaving it as small as possible. It's one of those questions where you get the answer that you asked us not to do, that political kind of <laughs> how are we going to surf to ride that middle line. Uh, I'll just very clearly say I support the cap, keeping it where it is. Um, you know, you mentioned um, the unintended consequences. I mean, you could totally devastate the industry with any kind of change right now, especially with the Affordable Health Care Act coming in. I think we need to keep it where it's at. This is a battle that's been going on for 38 years. Um, I want to make sure that clinics are, are open and that people are protected so that they can go into clinics and that the clinics are protected. I haven't had a chance to look at the entire initiative. I know they have to collect 400,000 signatures before even qualify. Um, but I know this is a battle that's been going on for a very long time and we need to protect our community. Great, we're gonna have closing statements now, one minute each, and then I see when last Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. First, I just wanna thank you and everybody for coming out tonight, uh, today, I'm sorry. Uh, this is an interesting race, it's an important race. As I said before, unfortunately, probably less than 10% of the registered voters will even vote. But thank you for coming and for supporting the uh, the MICA uh, candidate forum. I, I just wanted everybody to know that uh, my position is that I, I'm a businessman, I, I'm, I'm an independent person, and I'm not gonna be uh, part of the lobbyists and special interests or anything like that. I'm um, born and raised in the Valley, I represent the Valley. I'm a, my slogan is elected representative, not a, not a politician. And uh, and I really do uh, appreciate all your support, I appreciate you coming out. And uh, I, I think what we need in Sacramento are honest and ethical leaders in, in Sacramento. And I, I, I think uh, I would represent that, so thank you again. 
I have found that the, the, the best time for business is when the legislature is on recess. Um, and we've kind of created that environment here uh, in California, and we need to fix that. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't state this enough. There are some serious issues going on with California right now, and I want to go up and fight to make sure the valley gets its fair resources and that we're not neglected, that we bring the valley to Sacramento. I think that for too long, you know, we're focusing on the frivolous. So that's going to be my number one priority is to make sure the valley priorities are advocated for in Sacramento. And quickly, with the remaining time, I remember I went to uh, Wilbur Avenue Elementary in Tarzana, and we did a time capsule of what we wished we would see. I think what we want now is that the basics are done right, that we have a good education system, take care of our seniors, and a long-term sustainable economy. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you for having us all here today. I really appreciate having the time to um, introduce myself. I'm an educator. I have not worked in politics. I am proud to say that I do have the endorsement of Bob Blumenfield, who left this seat to uh, go to city council. And he feels that I am the best qualified candidate to succeed him in the legislature. And I'm very proud of that. I'm a working person. I'm a mom. I have over 50 years of life experience that I bring to this position. And I feel like I am a regular person, just like all of you, who's had to struggle with childcare, healthcare, unemployment, underemployment, trying to put kids through college. Um, I feel like I understand the Valley and I understand each and every one of you and your needs. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming out today. Um, we've benefited from some terrific leadership in the Valley. Bob Hertzberg, Keith Richmond, these are people who went up to Sacramento and really got work done, in part because they understood how the system worked, and they brought the values of the San Fernando Valley up to the capital in a way that they could really uh, achieve great things for our Valley. That's what I want to do as a candidate. Uh, I am the only candidate on this stage who has worked uh, with state government issues from a state government office and achieved real results for the Valley, working hand in hand with business groups like FICA at every step of the way. I'm a pragmatic progressive. Um, I have a big vision for this Valley and what we can accomplish on the side of Sacramento, uh, what we can accomplish working together. Uh, but I'm gonna make that vision happen by working step by step in achievable ways, um, not just saying what we want, but actually getting what we want. I'm proud to be here today standing before you endorsed by such vital luminaries as Kobe King, as Marty Cooper, Mel Cohn, uh, Carolyn Casavan, uh, and our state senator for the area, Fran Pavley. Uh, they know I'm the one that can go up to Sacramento to make this happen. Thank you. I want to thank Vika and everyone for being here today and hosting this forum. Uh, I also want to take an opportunity to thank my opponents for being here. Uh, this is obviously a difficult process to go through, but I consider them all friends and look forward to doing some more of these. Uh, Ninety years ago, my great-grandfather came to the Valley from Iowa. He came here in search of a better life for my family. And uh, four generations later, I was able to go to UCLA and graduate, a school where he worked as a laborer to help build. Um, to him, the Valley and Southern California, and California in general, wasn't just a destination. It was really a mindset. It was a place where he would be able to come live out his dreams and had opportunity that he had nowhere else. For too many Californians, this is going away, and it's because we're losing our industries, we're losing our way of life, and we have to do something at a state level. Uh, I look forward to going to Sacramento to make sure that I fight every day for the Valley, like I've done in Congressman Sherman's office, to help businesses with problems small and big, to help constituents and residents you know, understand their government and get the resources they deserve. I'm lucky to be endorsed by Congressman Brad Sherman, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, but also business leaders like Sid Leibovich, Howard Keyes, and Edgar Escalante, because they know that I'll fight every day for businesses in the Valley to make sure that we are all able to prosper. Thank you so much. Great, thank you all for participating, and thank you for all coming, and I want to thank sponsors, State Farm Insurance, Public Health and Services, and Civil Justices. And applause for our moderator. Yeah.